Hello and welcome to the Burgundy Years podcast. I am your host, Jesse Zilka, and I am so excited to be here with you guys. Um, I cannot wait to start this journey with this amazing um, concept that I've uh, kind of cultivated in my head. Um, basically, the Burgundy Years podcast is going to be um, a time where I sit down with artists or fans or just anybody that's been connected to this uh, incredible era of Christian music and just kind of pick their brain, not necessarily about their faith, but just about music and what uh, they love from that era and what makes them believe that that era was so important and so unforgettable. Um, I'm so excited about our first guest. He's a pal of mine. I, I love him to death. He's probably one of the nicest guys I have ever met. His name is Eric Collins and he was the lead singer of a band called Denison Mars. Now, Eric and I are from the same hometown, and so it's really cool not only to talk to Eric because he's a hometown guy um, who kind of grew up in the same atmosphere that I did, but also because as a younger person, I watched him play music and get really popular in the scene um, and you know, really connect to um, what he represented and what he stood for. Um, it's a really great, fun time. Um, Eric and I just sit, tell silly stories about our experiences um, going to shows. Um, Eric kind of talk. Eric kind of talks about what it uh, feels like to meet heroes of his um, in this industry, and uh, basically just his memories uh, that he shares with some really cool people. Uh, I think you're absolutely going to have a blast listening to this conversation. So, thank you again so much for joining us. Um, if you want to find us on social media, hit us up on Facebook or Instagram. You can also shoot us an email at burgundyearspod at gmail.com. We would love to hear from you. Let us know what you think about this episode. And um, let's go ahead and turn over and uh, listen to my conversation with Eric Collins of Denison Mars. Eric Collins, you are my first guest. On the Burgundy Years podcast, how do you feel? I feel are you, great. Are you excited to be here? Yes, very excited. Thank you. Good, good. I'm so well. Thank you. Thank you for gracing us with your presence, sir. Please. You are um, royalty as it is <laughs> in this era of music. I uh, know you rolled you roll your eyes at me because you don't think so. Yeah. And that's why you're great. <laughs> but it's true. Um. So for those that maybe don't know who you are or know what you are part of, can you just kind of give us a little synopsis of um, who, who is Eric Collins? It's so existential. <laughs> um, musically, um, Lakeland, Florida, we started Denison Mars. Um, it was under a different name back then, but we won't go that far back unless you absolutely <laughs> force me. Okay. Okay. Um, and then, uh, let's see, like we, we played a lot, toured a lot, the whole nation, record deals, all that stuff. Um, then came a little middle thing called the party people. Um, that was wild and crazy and fun for a minute. And I mean, you were the party people. So yes, that makes sense. Right. Exactly. And then, uh, what came after that was the dark romantics. We did that as, uh, like a family project kind of thing. Oh. That was pretty cool and fun. And did that for a few years, and then out of that came Mystery and Sea, which is a solo project, but I have pretty much roped most of my friends into playing instruments for me <laughs> at some time, <laughs> forced them. Yes. And, and then also, at the same time, I do a little thing called the Ghost Beat, which is like my love of hip-hop instrumentals stuff like that so it's not a kind of huge like, is it like uh like lo-fi kind of stuff or... yeah 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 it's very like cool. growing up with dj shadow and and mm -hmm. um a bunch of different other producers massive attack things like that and yeah kind of putting them all together public enemy i mean just since i was a kid until now and it's pretty much just a, another release like another yeah. you know what i mean um yeah definitely Yes, very cool. And and you're about to drop something with Mr. Ian C, aren't you? Like another EP? Yes, we did uh, four four new songs, um, which will be out on Velvet Blue Music from California. And we we got the test pressing back. It's going to be on 7-inch. Um, so we're waiting on when they'll tell us they're going to be actually pressed. Mm. And it's looking like 
probably January, February, something like that. That's not too bad. That's not too bad. Yeah. I can't wait for that. That's going to be super exciting. I can't exciting. wait either, and I've been sitting on it for so long, it's killing me. I'm sure. I'm sure. Well, okay, so um, that's great. So f- the reason that we brought you on, of course, um, Dennis and Mars was a really awesome band back in the day. Mm, I was telling, you. I actually recorded with another guest earlier today, and um, <clears throat> my episode two guest, and I was telling him that when you and I met for the first time, and you may not even remember this, but when you and I met for the first time, I shook your hand and I was like, I have a DVD of Cornerstone 2002 with you on it. Oof. And you said, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like me. Yep. And I was like, oh, I knew I'm going to be friends with this guy because uh, he totally doesn't take himself seriously at all. No. Um, <laughs> but for me on my end, Dennis and Mars has been in my life for years. I mean, obviously, I'm a native of Lakeland like you are. And so... Um, Dennis and Mars kind of started in our hometown, but, um, my brother and I both followed your career with that band for a long time. And it's just great to have you on because I feel like you, you were at the kind of the center of that really amazing time of faith-based music, um, Mm. that we don't really have as much anymore. No, And, um, I feel like it's such an important time little time capsule in music and I love talking about it so I guess what I want to do in this episode is kind of just pick your brain about like what from that time period that era did you love what did you listen to like who inspired you um so I'm going to kind of throw it your way and see see what your response is I love this idea I love it um I don't know if I would say I was at the center of that yes you were I we were like on an orbit maybe um Man. Well, you know what? In Lake of Florida, you were the center. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> Maybe, still. <laughs> you still uh, are, absolutely. <laughs> thanks. Um, man. Well, okay, so the era you're talking about, I mean, we can... I mean, e- it can kind of precede... Yeah, let me precede It can kind of go it. before Dennis and Mars, like when you were, when you were t- a teenager... In high school, I'll take obviously. you back even before that. Let me okay, kick it we'll off with it. so Go. you can so you can laugh at me and with Go me. all the way to birth. I don't care. <laughs> um, let's. How old was I? Man, like tween, if not slightly younger. Um, listening to like Petra, and yeah, Striper man. and stuff like that. Going to um, Walt Disney World for Night of Joy with mm-hmm. either with my parents and then youth groups and just being like this is the most amazing thing because like Petra's playing in front of the the castle you my know? parents my parents were at that show oh so good um like stripe I didn't ever got to see striper in concert but I was around when they were doing concerts at yep. the end um I'm trying to think of some other ones but I mean, that was when I was a kid, kid, and that was my first, like, actual Christian music and rock. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, so then there was a break there as I was teenager, and I'm listening to, like, Public Enemy and, and hip-hop stuff and whatever, and my mom raised me on classic rock. So I've got classic yeah. rock, and then I've got hip-hop and rap, and then right probably when I'm in high school and right after is when I start realizing that there's Christian alternative uh, rock and roll and stuff. And I'm like, that's crazy. For one thing, um, I, I have it written down in my notes to share with you that I remember going to Lakeland Square Mall when the family bookstore was in the mall. Yes. Um, not when it was the outside one. It was still right. in the mall. And I would right. go in there and I just remember standing at the demo they had like a demo section, or not a section, but they had a demo with each album, like CD or tape or whatever. Uh huh. Yeah. And I would just grab like handfuls and go over to the little Walkmans and just listen, like sample the albums. Yeah. So and I'd be in there for so long, um, but I remember the first one I bought was Starfire Fifty Nine Silver, mm-hmm. and I remember I bought the CD. <clears throat> and I walked, I, I went out of the mall and I got in my car and it, you know, I was parked out in the food court area because that's yes. where you parked when you yeah, went it to is. It's the be- It's the most central <laughs> location to the mall. Honestly, it is. <laughs> and I remember popping in Silver 
and it just cranked right you know i mean that album just starts and it's yes. heavy shoegaze heavy and i just remember thinking like there's no way this is christian this is not right. christian music because christian music was corny you know what i mean yeah. like yeah. between petra and striper there was like a really big time of like corny just not my kind of thing and i just remember like i just had silver cranked and just song after song i'm just like what I was like, it kind of sounds like Smashing Pumpkins. It kind of yeah. sounds like Deftones. It, because you know, there's like the heavy, the heavy riffs and mm -hmm. stuff. I was just blown away, and and that was my first, that was the first album that set me off, for like the the era of Christian alternative that we're talking about here. And man, uh, there was you know, I think that launched me into going through the whole Tooth and Nail catalog, like whatever yeah. I could get. And like even back then inside the CDs and cassettes, they had like little mail order mm -hmm. menus and it like had little pictures of the albums and stuff. And it, I mean, I would just stare at those and stare at liner notes. And and I would, you know, back then bands would thank other bands that they were friends yeah. with or tour. And I'm like, well, I got to check out this band. I got to check out this band. Writing down, taking notes. And yeah, yeah. Like taking notes, trying to. I mean, websites were kind of not great back then. So you're like trying to see <laughs> if they have any kind of online presence. And yep. Um, saving up money to order stuff through the mail or whatever if Family Bookstore didn't have it. Um, yeah. I'm trying to remember. I think the second, I mean, there was some there was some Christian albums in there after that, especially from Tooth and Nail that were just like crazy. Um, the next one that was huge for me was Staves Acre Friction. Yes, was their first one, and I remember getting it, and again just being like this is next level. Like, I can't believe this is Christian. The music is awesome. And this yes. guy singing, he's like, it's sing incredible. Yeah. He's like singing CS Lewis. Like he's making my mind grow. You know what I yeah. mean? Like, yeah. Like this isn't corny. This isn't Sunday school lyrics. You know what I mean? Like this mm -hmm. is real deal. He's, he's honest. He's thought provoking. He's creative. And the band is just rocking. And I remember taking the CD to my girlfriend, who's my wife now, taking it to her. And I'm like, babe, you got to hear this. This is Christian. Yeah. And like, and she was like, she, she was punk. Like she was face to face and like surf punk and skate punk mm -hmm. and all this stuff. And she's like, well, this is actually good. Like, she's like, when you told me it was Christian, I didn't want to listen to it. She's like, this is actually good. And then we got her friend. Like, you got to listen to this guy. Steve Zaker. Yeah. Um, like just passing around here, here, here. Yeah, yeah. We're like, come on, jump in the car. We got to drive around yeah. Lakeland with this turned up just so you can hear it. Because you're not yeah. going to believe that this is Christian. Not to mention that Mark <clears throat> Solomon's voice is just out of this world. Yeah. I mean, it's just so special and unique. Yep. I mean. Yep, yep. So good. Um, those are the two albums. And like I said, there was there was some mixed in there, definitely. Because yeah. um, I was just hungry. I was like, just eating all of them I could find. But those two, Star, uh, Starfly 59 Silver and Staves Acre Friction were the ones that floored me right off the bat and just got me so encouraged and inspired um, and excited, yeah. like got me excited, you know? So when you were propelling towards what would become Dennis and Mars, was it kind of your <clears throat> idea to kind of do something similar to that? Like, were you like, I love the direction that these bands are taking I kind of want to do the same thing or did it kind of just flow naturally in the way that it did? It, it was both. I would say it probably flowed naturally more, but <clears throat> then, I mean, I was just getting into this, to Christian alternative, you know what I mean? Like, so I was listening to Pumpkins and Hum and, yeah. and, and these bands. Pearl Jam. You yeah, know, Pearl Jam, really yeah. Pearl Jam. Definitely. And, um, yeah, all of those. And so... I was already on that path of like, I want to make music like this. You know, I was yeah. just so inspired. But then as a Christian to hear the level that these guys came out with, I was just like, yeah, you know what I mean? And mm -hmm. on top of that is these guys were all honest and not cheesy. You know what yeah. I mean? Like not corny. They were talking about real deal things, whether it was artsy or real life, you know what I mean? Thought and troubles or whatever. So that inspired me naturally, um, which I already was raised to do and wanted to do was to be honest with my art, but for it to glorify God in an right. honoring way, you know, like do all things to the glory of God. I want to do that with music and I didn't want to yeah. force it. I didn't want to be like, 
all right, well, I got this song. Now I got to write my Christian lyrics. You know, I didn't want to yes. do that. I wanted to be artistic and represent the blessings that I felt that I was given, you know what I mean, by God. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to express that artistically without being dishonest or like preachy or anything. Like that. I didn't want yeah, to be all absolutely. that stuff, you know. And I'm listening. As, as wonderful as Petra and Striper are, especially to people that grew up with them, mm-hmm. because they're kind of a childhood memory. Like I was literally teethed. I think yeah. I came out of the womb <laughs> hearing "Beat the System" by Petra. Yes, I mean, my yes. dad played that record to death. Awesome. Um, and I have a very it has a very special place in my heart. Mm-hmm. But that music is it is so blatant is a crude word i feel like but it has more of a blatant message than some of the stuff that you're talking about yeah it it doesn't feel as um artistic and as um experimental and Mm -hmm. um broad reaching like some of the stuff that we're talking about today. yeah and you know and it 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 reminded me of you too like you too was a great example of being true to who they were and their faith and everything, but not sure. preaching at people and also not being corny. Yeah, for um, sure. I mean, definitely in their early albums, even, you know mm-hmm. what I mean? Um, so, but I wasn't real into them at that point. You know, I'd listen to them back out of them again because I was more into like newer, the newer, heavier stuff or whatever. So then to hear these guys doing it, I'm just like, oh, yeah, it's possible. You know, they're doing mm-hmm. it. Oh my God, I'm so encouraged. I'm so inspired. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <clears throat> so when you were, you move past the early stages and you're getting into Dennis and Mars and you're touring and everything, obviously, like I said, I have a DVD of you singing your heart <laughs> out at Cornerstone 2002. Uh, um, like, who were some of the bands circulating around you that you were connected with or that you thought were making really great music at the time that you were a part of the scene a bit more? Well, you know what's weird is <laughs> Starflyer and Stavesacre became heroes and inspirations. Yeah. And then through Dennis and Mars, I met them and toured with them. And it yeah. just blew my mind. And and even now, I usually do not want to meet heroes. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I never want to meet Radiohead. I don't want to talk to them. I don't, I, what if they're weirdos? Because you'd be disappointed. Yeah, yeah. what if they're jerks? They're going, they're going to be weirdos. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I can name so many artists that I just don't mm-hmm. want to meet. I just want to keep them, you know, in their own zone in my head. And I just want to be inspired by them. And I don't want to meet them on a personal level. But I meet these guys and get to tour with them. And they turn out to be super cool, nice guys, like honest guys, just like their art. And I'm just like, what? And yeah. to this day, Jason Martin and Mark Solomon are like brothers to me and mentors, you know, and yeah. they would both deny that and say i'm crazy whatever because they're so such good dudes but i I remember going and recording um the first dark romantics album with jason martin he produced and recorded it and he let us stay at his house which is amazing yeah but this is such a little silly thing but i remember waking up and uh we were sleeping in a loft um and i remember just waking up and I was sleeping by his desk or whatever. I didn't even realize it. And I get up and his Bible and like a little notebook is there. And it's totally like his morning devotions thing. You know what Mm -hmm. I mean? And I don't know that it really like encouraged me that Mm -hmm. this dude is such a cool guy. Like he is 100% legit Southern California, cool rock guy. You know what I mean? Yeah. But in my eyes and in many people's eyes. I mean, he, he's literally like a legend at this point. Yeah, and, he is. and yet here he is still doing like morning devotions and has his Bible out. And it's not like a prop, you know, like you can tell yeah. that it's actually read and used. And I, don't, I was just like, man, that's that's not even music. That's not even any of this world. And it still encourages me and inspires yeah. me, you know. Yeah, and whether sure. you're a Christian or not the guy is still being true to to himself and his right. beliefs and his faith, you know, whatever it may be. That's what his is and mine too. Um, So those two guys, I got, I get to tour with Starflyer 59 multiple times and become buddies with this, literally the guy, the artist that got me into all of it. 
Mm-hmm. That never happens for people. That is so weird and awesome. You know what I mean? And really, one of I I consider him one of the people that really started this. Yeah. Whole era in general, because yep. Starfire's Silver is like one of Tooth and Nail's like first yeah. ever albums, and is such an iconic. And even outside of the Christian industry, like Starfire is considered like one of the best shoegaze. Yeah. artists ever yeah you know? that's crazy so right he he really did reach broad audiences yep but like you said when you see his bible sitting on his desk it really it's humbling because it makes him feel like a real person right 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 like he's not some entity he's just yep. a guy you know right his yeah life. yep and still like mentoring me and encouraging me without him trying or knowing it you know and i right. think i don't know that's so cool that is very um cool. and especially when uh, not to speak ill of anyone or to do anything. There's been a lot of Christian music leaders or whatever that have fallen off. Yeah. You know absolutely. what I mean? And you could almost see it coming a lot of times because it maybe it was a little kind of shallow or whatever, what they were always singing about or speaking about. Yep. Um, so then there's this guy and Mark and a few others that I can name that are still strong and true and honest and that is so awesome to me just as as viewing them another human being Mm -hmm. and especially in this day and age age where everything is canceled and everything is yes flip floppy and everything else and it's and and just on a spiritual note it's hard to be a christian right now yeah it's really hard yeah you know yeah and it's really cool that these guys have kind of weathered some of the storms Mm -hmm. that like you were saying, there's so many artists that I I was raised on that have kind of walked, sat down and walked away from their faith. And, mm-hmm. you know, they have to do what they have to do, obviously. Right. But, you know, it is really encouraging to see some of these pillars that were involved in this industry, in this era of music that are yeah. kind of staying true to who they were from the beginning. Yep, for, for sure. sure. Um, well, I, was, I had a couple more, I think. Um, I was trying to oh, think of some it. other ones that were around. Um well, like Jeff Cloud uh, was bass player in Starflyer at the time and for a while mm-hmm. and a few records. And he's the owner and operator of Velvet Blue Music. Okay. Um, so making friends with him or with Starflyer led to Dennis and Mars' second album being on Velvet mm-hmm. Blue and even the third and hooking up with Floodgate Records after that and stuff. So um, Jeff Cloud even introduced me to other artists and bands uh, whether in person or just handing me albums. Like one of the albums he handed me was 238 Regulate the Chemicals. And that album just floored me. Yeah. Um, and, and I'm trying to remember what year that was. I don't, Google it. Yeah. Um, I just, that record just was like, and they're Florida guys. It yeah. was, but they're panhandle, so it's like another world to us. Uh-huh. Before, you know, <laughs> yeah, so. for real. Yeah, it's because um, it's seven hours away. That's the same length as Atlanta. Yeah. That is actually another world. Yeah, it's a different state. Um, but just listening to that, there's so many riffs, and like it was, it was so different. I just remember, like, what is what am I listening to right now? Yeah, and we ended up becoming like, back in the day, I don't feel like people collab like this anymore, or at least not as much, but. Back then, I was just like, call them. Uh, like, you guys are awesome. Come down and play shows with us. We're gonna just yeah. going to book shows and, and show everybody, show you off. You know what I mean? And then mm-hmm. they're like, well, you got you to gotta come up here. So we just started playing shows and then started touring. Um, you know, and they, they were on Take Hold and then went to Tooth and & Nail and did, did all the festivals and stuff, too. Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, Dear Ephesus was a huge one. Mm-hmm. For, for a minute and uh, made buddies with those guys and are still friends with all those dudes. Um, they were, you know, Orlando and we ended up mm-hmm. playing. Of course, we played a lot of shows and did some tours and even did tours as our other bands. Yeah. Um, good dudes. Awesome guys. Hilarious. Um, lots of ridiculous stories with those guys, with everybody. But <laughs> yeah, um, man, yeah. Um, I know it's a lot to it's a lot to decompress. Yeah. Oh, you know a good a good one was uh, Prayer Chain. Did you ever get into Prayer Chain? I didn't listen to them growing up, but I do. I have listened to them 
as an adult. Yeah, and yeah. So I do know who they are. Yes. The, I was I was late on them too because they weren't tooth and nail. They were like this other. They were yeah. always something else. Um, to me, it was funny. They were always like the like mature alternative rock guys. Kind of, they you know really I mean? were, yeah. Um, but they were legendary even back then, and I remember like it was really difficult to get their CDs because they weren't on these bigger labels or whatever. Mm -hmm. They were always kind of pioneering their own stuff, but so it was difficult to get their CDs. So whenever we we would fight really hard to get them, and then just like would eat them up. Um, yeah. But they were like legends. And I remember being on tour in California with Starflyer. And I think we had like two days off and we're hanging out with Jeff Cloud at his apartment. And we're like, what are we doing? And he's like, oh, we're gonna, let's go to this barbecue. You guys can come with us. We'll come with me. And we go to this house, like normal house. And we walk in the backyard and it's literally all of Starflyer and their families all of prayer chain and their families and a few other big Southern California. And I just remember I shrunk. I felt like I was about yeah. an inch big and I'll just, I, I'm pretty sure that I just backed up against the fence <laughs> and was just like frozen staring at everyone. Like, Oh my gosh, there's, there's the drummer from prayer chain. And there's, you know, like I'm like pointing it yeah. out and I wouldn't talk. We wouldn't talk to anyone. We're just super shy and quiet. Like we're just little goofy Florida boys, you know, and like <laughs> we're in Southern California and with these Christian alternative legends. And then they bring us into the house and giving us food and drink. And they're like, we're going to play some blackjack. You guys sit down. And I'm like, I, I couldn't even talk. It was like a funny movie. I'm like, oh, like a mumbling and I don't know what to do. And then I think, and then like two days later, we all, we were there because we played some Christian fest downtown, yeah. like in, I don't even remember, Anaheim or something. And mm -hmm. and there was more people everywhere. And I'm just like, oh my gosh, look at all you. That's, That's how I felt as a fan whenever I went to Cornerstone, Illinois for the first time. Oh, I that mean, place I, is magical. I, we were big Cornerstone, Florida people. Mm -hmm. We attended every Cornerstone, Florida, and they were great. Mm -hmm. Um. I simultaneously loved and hated Cornerstone, Illinois, because yeah. I am so nice, nasty, and I don't like getting dirty. I don't love to be outside often. So it was rough. It's a rough time. Now, my dad rented an, a little, like, it wasn't like a massive RV, but it had, like, a little bathroom in it, and I literally would just, like, lay in there and be like, I just want to go home. But looking back on it... <laughs> I've been, I just, but I've been there and I feel you. As a 13-year-old, I was just like, this is the worst thing ever. Yeah, um, I feel that. But walking around, you know, during the day, because I wasn't, my brother was more into like a lot of the smaller bands that were playing, whereas I liked more of like the main stage people. Oh, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I would kind of spend my day like just walking around and looking like at the freaking giant merch tent that they had yeah and the amount of people that i would like i'd be like holy crap they're so and so oh my god that's so and so the yeah. first concert we ever saw <clears throat> that at that festival i think was dead poetic i think mm -hmm. and andrew schwab from project 86 just comes and stands like 10 feet from me and my little 12 13 year old brain was like Ugh! yep exactly like, just freaking out like, yeah I was like, oh my gosh it's andrew schwab man freak out yeah and then i think i saw mark solomon at some point i don't know if they were there or not i feel like yeah they i were. feel like he was there yeah um because i think we went in 2004 okay. or so um you were you there for that one i don't know if you guys would have been there for that one or not um yeah i think that might have been the last one yeah. we'd ever played yeah yeah but it was so i probably saw you and i was probably mm. like oh my god um but anyway, you know, you're such because, a celebrity. No, no, no. Because at that point, we were like you, and we were sick of sweating and being dirty. So we you're would, like, I'm staying inside. Yeah, we got the hotel that was like a 15, 20 minute drive, and we would stay at the hotel and swim, and then we'd come play the show, and yep. then go back to the hotel. And we would literally like, That's draw That's what straws. I wish I was doing. Yeah. We're like, you're it. You have to sit at the merch table. We're going to the pool. Oh my God. Yeah. Total I remember rock star walking, jerks. <laughs> I remember walking through that merch booth. I was talking to um, the bass player of the chariot Oh, because wow. that they were, they were just climbing up into popularity mm -hmm. and my brother like idolized the lead singer at the time. Yeah. And I was sitting there talking to him 
and he was taking a duster and dusting off all of the CDs sitting on their Sick. merch booth because it was so yep. grimy and yep. gross. And you just felt like it didn't matter how many oh. showers you took. It just felt like you constantly had a coating of dirt yeah. upon your skin. It was So you were 13 weird. at that one? I was young. I was like okay. 12 or 13, I See, think. See, here's yeah. the difference. If you were would have been 15... Or older. Oh, I would have loved it. It would have you would just been like mad freedom, like oh, yes. you know what I'm saying. Like you would just been like you would have been up and out. Like I'll, I'll be back. Well, later that was tonight. my brother because my yeah. brother was like in high school. Yeah. And just had the time of his life. I mean, yeah. he'd get up at eight thirty to go out and see the the new bands that nobody knew about. Yeah. And he'd be out till two in the morning seeing you know yes whoever Norma Jean under oath like whoever was playing. Yep. Yeah, because um, they did the midnight shows at the Uncle yeah. tent. So, yeah, it yeah. would go to like mm-hmm. 1, one thirty. Yeah, I know. I'd be laying there at night because I'm like in bed at like 9.30 <laughs> in Cornerstone. And I'm laying in there and I'm like oh. up in the, my bunk and I'm like, I swear if I don't get out of this place. Oh, man. But, you know, looking back on it, I absolutely loved it. Yeah. I just was, you know, a yeah. total brat. as a, yeah. I, was a, I was a middle schooler. Yeah, yeah. Nobody likes middle schoolers. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but I'll never forget, and I, I hold this over my mom's head all the time. We were coming back from main stage, and this guy, like, runs up to me, and he's like, Hey, hey, Joy Electric is about to hold a rave at yes. so-and-so's tent. Do you yes. want to come? And I loved Joy Electric. And I, like, looked at my mom, and I was like, please let me go. And she's like, no, it's too late. And oh. we ended up going back. And I... To this day, tell her, I'm like, you ruined that event for me because that was my one sliver of joy and you took it from me. (laughs) Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure I was at that. For real? Oh, my God. Because I made friends with with Ronnie through Jason Mm -hmm. and we we played some shows together. We never toured, but anytime I saw him, I'd hang out with him because he's such a character. Um, That's the funny thing is the Martin brothers are the coolest literally coolest dudes like you're around them and the the cool you feel how cool they are yeah yeah but they're so nice and there's they are so funny but they're like the dry don't crack a smile funny i can so see th- that the stuff that comes out of their mouth it's all jokes but they don't ever smile yeah. you know what i mean so like you want to hang out with them because they're, you're just literally laughing the whole time and they're not smiling at all it's like the bit. It's like they have this stand-up yeah. comedian bit. They definitely could have been. Um, but yeah, anytime I'd see Ronnie, I'd want to hang out with him. But I remember that. I remember the rave tent for one thing, and I remember Joy Electric doing a set, and I was like, oh, I loved it. I know. I. Oh, I wish I could have gone. I'm sorry. I won't talk amazing. about it. No, it's okay. You could talk about it. <laughs> um, I'll live vicariously through your memories. But um, yeah, Ronnie is like one of my like. If I can get Ronnie on here, I mean, my God, I've named this podcast after one of his songs. Yeah. If I can get him on here, I feel like I will have reached the pinnacle of fandom because mm. it's like, I will tell him, like, I was going to be at that. I was going to go. I was there in spirit. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And he's going to be like, you're freaking weird. Have you reached out to him yet? I have reached out to him. I haven't heard from him, but that's okay. I really feel like... um because this is such a young podcast, I've yeah, got to yeah. get some episodes under my belt. And yeah, maybe, yeah. you know, we'll get some people on here. I mean, I do have people coming on. Um, Andrew, the drummer of Fiverr and Frenzy, he's mm-hmm. going to be on here. And then David, the lead singer of Pax 217, he's going to come on. Um, so I've got people... I've got people slated. It's happening. It's I'll hit up happening. Ronnie. I'm going to hit up Ronnie and try oh to Oh my God, please. It. I will freak out if you get Ronnie. I'll tell I'll you right now, you will never get Jason. Because he is I so know. I'm private. not even. He doesn't do I'm, that. But Ronnie, I'm not even concerned about that. Ronnie might is could be a strong maybe. Yeah. So we'll see. Okay. Well, well, don't get my hopes too high. Cause okay. I'm I, not going to talk about it because I don't know if I can do it. But I'll at least try. <laughs> so like we discussed earlier, I'm going to go ahead and hit up these rapid fire questions because I know we're going to have to break them down. And talk. It's going <laughs> to take 20 minutes to talk about each of them. Okay. Um. So the first thing I want to do is ask you from that era, which we've kind of talked a little bit about it. But your top five favorite bands from that time period of mm. Christian music. Okay. Obviously, Starfire and I would say Stave Saker. So we, we know those two. Yes. Um, man, I'll, I'll say 238. That's three. 
I'm gonna go heavy. I'm gonna say living sacrifice. Heck yeah, so man. There's four. Five is tough to pick. Bruce is another one of my. Bruce is such a good dude. pinnacle. He's, pinnacle. He's such guess. a good dude. Um, if I say like four names all at once, you won't be able to stop me, and then it'll count as. <laughs> okay, go. <for laughs> no, it. I'm just kidding. I don't know, man. Um, I don't. I don't know. Um, I should have got CDs down so I could like remember. Right. Let's let's throw a weird one in and say Roadside Monument. Okay. And that was just because I saw them at Cornerstone. Didn't know who they were because they're like Seattle and I'm Florida. Yeah. So, you know what I mean? Total opposite ends. Yeah. yeah. And they played that album. Um, What is it? Seven seconds, eight seconds, 11 seconds, whatever, of from being a man or something. <laughs> they were like my jaw dropped i was like mm -hmm. i couldn't even they were so bonkers like just to, i had never heard anything like that before i don't think i've listened to that album you'll have to send that to me man i will and it's crazy and it, it was just insane like i didn't know what was happening and i remember right after the show they came down and they were just standing at a table with a with a box of cds and people were just throwing money at them yeah. And they were just like the coolest Seattle indie rock dudes. Like, I didn't even want to talk to them. I didn't want them to talk to me. I just wanted their CD and I like run away because they were so <laughs> you rad. You think with that. You just I do, don't I do. want to make I know, people. I don't. I don't want to. I'm not the talker guy. I just want them to be awesome and not ruin it <laughs> in case they might. Um, but yeah, I'll throw that Your one in. Your faith in people is just so inspiring. Oh. No. I know. That is a bad thing. <laughs> oh, it's okay. Okay, so um, this is going to be harder for you, I think, than the first question, so prepare yourself. Oh, I'm terrible um, at this. Top five albums from that time. <sighs> so, okay. Obviously, Starflyer Silver, but that's not my favorite Starflyer record, if you can believe it. Okay. It's definitely, like, insane how big it is in my life. But musically... Starflyer 59's Leave Here a Stranger. Okay. Um, that album was just like blew my mind. And so that's that's one. The second Staves Acre album, um, Absolutes. Mm -hmm. Friction, of course, got me. Absolutes was is the one. And Mark is going to be super mad at me for saying that because he doesn't want to hear it. That's old school. You know what I'm saying? That's old. Oh, it's yep. an old album. Blah, 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 blah. But. Suck it up, Mark. I don't care if you're hearing this. That's right. You tell him. <laughs> so, okay. So that's two. Um, I, I mentioned Regulate the Chemicals by 238. Mm -hmm. um, Living Sacrifice. Um, it's a tough one between Reborn and Hammering Process. Yes. So Reborn's the one that got me. And then Hammering Process, hammering is, process. is the one that just killed me. Hammering Process is, is legendary. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, and it's just like the other albums. When I heard Reborn, I'm like, this is Christian. This is awesome. Yeah. It doesn't even not just suck. It's amazing. And then mm -hmm. Hammering Process. And I'm like, oh, my God. You know what I'm saying? Yes. Okay. So is that four? That's four. Five. Yes, that's four. Uh, I don't even know. Um, that's not an answer. I know. It's so tough. I'm not good at this anyways. <laughs> I Like, I have to have so much thought. And with when it comes to music, because everything is so important to me, like overly than it should be, I make have to make lists and all this stuff. Um, I'm the same way, man. I feel it. Oh, you're gonna make me say number five, and I don't even. Yep, know. I am. I I'll know. wait all night. I don't know. Uh, Just pick one. Pick a random one. Whatever pops in your head. Throw a random one out there. Yeah. Hmm. The silence is great for the podcast. I know. I'm sorry. You're doing, it's your <laughs> fault, <kidding>. though. <laughs> I know. I'm just getting hard time. Man, it all de it's like it, de it depends on like the mood I was in. Like POD was, okay. you know what I'm saying? Which like one? if I was like wanting that. Because listen, the fundamental elements of Southtown is yeah. a masterpiece. Yeah. 
And then you got the first Demon Hunter album, which I was yes, just dude. like, I was just like, what? Like, uh, and then Fine China, um, I forgot the name of it, but it's like they had two in a row that were just like amazing. Mm-hmm. And Joy Electric, pretty much, just pick one. Yep. Um, can can any of those count? Can you just count? Sure. One? Okay. Let's just count them all. Okay. Good. They all count as one. They're just one Squish big them in. album. Yeah. yeah. Good. Okay. So my <laughs> last question, and this is, I'm excited to hear about this because Uh-oh. I think this will, I think you can combine kind of your experience playing shows and seeing shows, but your top five live shows now. You can. P- I'd like you to break it down. Okay. Top five shows you watched, and top five shows you played. Oh, oh, dang! So that's like ten. That's not fair. That's ten. Ten shows, man. Ten <sighs> shows. Um. So what you get for being a musician? I'm I just know. God, and a music fan lover, way more. Okay, I'm not gonna be able to do them in order, but I at least can give to. you five and five. Um. I saw P.O.D. at the Refuge in St. Pete, which is... Did you ever go there? Would you ever... No. Okay. It was downtown before St. Pete was nice downtown. Yes. And it, this was a venue, like a punk venue slash homeless shelter. And okay. they did a lot. I mean, MXPX, uh, all kinds of stuff came. Um, I saw P.O.D. there and nobody came. This was before they were like... They were just, I think fundamentals was out or was it before that one brown brown album brown okay they were torn on brown and there was like nobody there and i remember they just like they played like it was packed like it was amazing and sonny's just talking to people and i'm just like this guy's heart is amazing and the and the band is incredible you know what i mean like yes and that was so early on i just remember being so impressed like and again, California dudes come all the way to Florida and just yep. killing it. And like non corny Christians that actually spoke like human beings. You know what I mean? Yep. <laughs> um, so that was one of them. Um, I remember seeing Stazaker at the Refuge. Uh, they were touring on Friction with MXPX. And I went. Oh, nice. Yeah, I went. And I mean, MXPX, I was like, I wasn't like a punk guy. So I was like, oh, they sound like Green Day. That's cool. Whatever. You know, oh, what I mean? MXPX was like my childhood. Yeah. So I did jump in the pit and all that stuff. But that's when Stazaker came on and I didn't know who they were. And they, I was just like, oh, who? Oh, my God. That was was Stazaker opening for MXPX? Yeah. Or was MXPX? Okay. Yeah. MXPX was on tour. I don't remember what album they were touring on, but Stazaker was opening for them touring on Friction, their first, okay. their first album. And I was just, they came out and I was just like, wow. I was just like dumbfounded. And I think that's when I bought Friction and took it home and played okay. it for my wife. Um, okay, so that's two. I never got to see Starflyer on tour until I toured with them. So that, I can't mm-hmm. even count that one in. You can count it when you do the ones you played. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, Roadside Monument when I saw him at Cornerstone because I just didn't even know what I was experiencing. I was just like at a loss. Um, I mean, these guys, they started with this song where it's just ripping like post-hardcore and the bass player is screaming into the microphone, which I know that sounds obnoxious, but it was amazing at the time. And he just (laughs) turns and just, he like, I think he knocked the mic down by accident or something, but instead of picking it up, he just turns and starts screaming out over the crowd. Oh, wow. And, like, I'm just like, what? Like <laughs> That's like one time I saw um, Emery at Cornerstone, Florida, mm-hmm. back when they were, like, in their first record, yeah. which is probably, to me, one of their most raw records. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the keyboardist would scream, and they were playing Walls. Mm-hmm. And at the very end, he does his, like, screaming song or whatever. And he screams so hard that when they finish the song, he turned around and just puked everywhere. <laughs> nice. Like, that is so rock and roll, yeah, it's not even regal. It is. Like, just screamed his lungs out to the point that he, like, made himself sick. Yeah. It was crazy. It's pretty rock and crazy. roll. Crazy. <laughs> 
That reminds me, it wasn't real, but I remember watching Zayo at Cornerstone and the lights went out. I'm sure that was fun. The lights went out and they exploded with the song and the lights came on and the singer was wearing all white and I, he had fake blood, I guess, and he had just smashed it on his face and it was like down his Ew. shirt. Yeah, but it's Zayo. It's, me- it's metal. And it, everyone was like, yes, like freaking out. Um, I saw Zayo one time with, I think they, I think they opened for Demon Hunter. Yeah, probably. I think it was Zayo, Living Sacrifice, and Demon Hunter. Oh, sick show. And I remember, look, I, I've never cared for Zayo. I'll be straight with you. Mm-hmm. And I remember sitting there and between every, like, they would literally stop songs to, like, fiddle with their guitars or whatever. And I'm just like, what is this drama that you're creating on stage? Yeah, like. Yeah. No offense to anybody listening that loves Zayo, because yeah. my, my brother's a big Zayo fan, so I, I get it. But, like, they were such drama queens. No, they did that Were a they lot. on again? Were they off again? Yeah. Were they on again? Were they off again? You just yep. never knew. For sure. That's definitely them. They've gone through it. Yeah. Um, how many How many am I at? Three. They're at three. Because Zayo doesn't count. That was just a funny memory. Uh, man. Trying to remember if there was Living Sacrifice. I did see them a couple times, but I can't. There's nothing that's like super sticking in my head. Um, and I mean, see, 238, but I toured with them, so I'd have to say that was probably that. They probably definitely fell in one of my favorite shows that I played, so that won't count. <sighs> So, and Joy Electric, I have one for that, too. Maybe I'll skip and then come back. Okay. Can we do that? Yes. Okay, okay. We'll start with Joy Electric, then. Played with Joy Electric at Family Christian Bookstore when it moved out of the Lakeland Square Mall. Shut up. Yeah. You must have been little, so you didn't come or you you didn't know. So, do you know what I'm talking about? Where it was? Yes, absolutely. Where it was... Like over by Red Lobster or whatever. The one that's now a dentist's office. Yes, yes. yes. So, Dennis and Mars and Joy Electric, we played. They like moved shelves and played back in there, and on the floor. Insane. Yeah, and ki- everyone just kind of semi-circled around us, and it was just Ronnie and Jeff and on keyboards and singing, and it was awesome. That was I really can fun. Can imagine that it freaking was. Yeah, I was stoked because it's in Lakeland. And at a family yeah. Christian bookstore, which we actually never really did in Lakeland. We played everywhere. So I don't know how we didn't play there more. That might be why. Maybe we shut it down. I don't know. <laughs> um, but that's one of them. It's just cool all the way around. Yep. Um, again, back to Staves Acre. We, we, Dennis and Mars, did pretty good in Dallas. And Staves Acre also did pretty good in Dallas. And I don't think it was mostly because of the bands. Dallas was just, probably still is. I just haven't been back in so long. It's a really good music city. Yeah. But also Christian because Christian music city because they had um, at least one radio show, if not some other stuff, that was actually pretty good. So they would mm-hmm. actually promote concerts if you could believe oh, it. Oh wow. I mean that's like an unheard of thing. Yeah, um, for real. But they would like promote and do like interviews and all kinds of stuff for these shows. And there was a place in Texas, uh, in Dallas, um, The Door. And it was this huge, awesome, total Generation X style venue, just massive with like a lo- uh, uh, like a loft kind of thing. You could stand and watch, look down mm-hmm. on bands. But it was huge. And um, we weren't on tour with them, but we kind of like met up or something. I thought, or maybe we might have been on tour. We did a bunch of tours of them, but the show was so packed that people got turned away outside. And this was like oh, wow. three, four hundred capacity room. And there was the line was way down the block. I mean, this is like rock and roll story style, but people didn't get in and it was packed yeah. out. And the show was sick. It was so hot and sweaty in there and this is a massive massive warehouse style venue but it's ac and everything but there was just so many people just having such a good time that it was like mm-hmm. sweaty i remember my glasses were foggy and sweaty like such a dork on stage but um the whole show went down and 
the people outside stayed outside. They didn't leave because they were just listening to the oh, show wow. from outside. And so Stavesacre was was bummed they didn't get in. And so they came to us and they're like, hey, we know it's really late. It was like midnight or something almost. And they're like, we know it's really late, but all these people stayed. Would you guys want to do a second show? And we're like, yes. That's incredible. Like, you'll let us play again. They're like, what? are you kidding? Of course. Like, you guys got to play. So we're like, yeah, we're in. And so they go and they start going down the line, talking to everyone, thanking them for staying. They're like, we're going to do another show. You guys can come into the second show. And it packed out again. That's insane. Yeah. And we played again, like started a show, a second show at like midnight and played again to another packed out. And like, it, it was just, I had never experienced anything. I had yet. I never have again. Um, but I just remember like those, I just was being so impressed with them as human beings, yeah. like to have such a heart. Cause they're, I mean, at that point they're like rock stars. They don't have, they can yeah. go to their they hotel, don't have to do anything. they can go yeah. eat, they can go chill and go to bed. And they're like, no, these kids came. They're still here. We're going to, we're going to do it. That's and that amazing. was just so impressive to me. And then to also be so kind to them, they went out and like shaking their hands and stuff and like talking to them. Like they don't have to do that. And no. you don't hear about people doing that. Non-Christians mm-hmm. don't do that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Let alone Christians that are actually like practicing what, you know what I'm saying? Like their faith. Yes biblical actual biblical things can you believe it yeah <laughs> <laughs> um, i know right so that was a that was a big one that is in my heart like gosh it was so awesome um so i did, i remember a really funny tour was with starflyer but this was when i was party people um and Dean Lorenz, who plays lead guitar for me, he's played every instrument for me. He did Dark Romantics with me. He came in and was the drummer at, for the last album of Dennis and Mars. And okay. then we did Party People together and we did Dark Romantics and now he plays Mystery and Sea with me. Um, but we were doing Party People and we're playing. I'm on bass and he's on guitar for Starflyer because um, Jason only brought a drummer. And we're doing this East Coast tour. Just I'm in heaven hanging out with Jason every day is awesome. But I remember he was getting so tired and he's like really missing home and wanting to go home. And we play at like some church over in Melbourne, like in the, at the beach. Uh-huh. And it's a total, and we had played like venues, like we played Atlanta and we're playing all these legit places. And then we get to Florida and have, we're playing a church and it's not the cool church shows that you look forward to. Yep. It's like, Oh, this guy, thought to do a lock-in with a rock band you know what i mean like it's oh, it's no. not even like because there was a really cool place in melbourne called the tab and they did legit shows at their church but it was like at a side room upstairs it was like awesome but this was like yeah. at some church and it was like a lock-in <laughs> or something oh, and oh, we're like my. in the sanctuary <laughs> No. And they've got like the Starflyer logo on projected on the wall and like it's just little kids and they're just like bebopping around. Oh, it's like little children? It's like little kids, family and youth kids. And like the teenagers don't care. They're like huddled up, kinda looking at us, kinda like doing their own thing. There's little kids trickling around. And I just I felt so bad for Jason. Can you know what I mean? Like yeah. He's a legit that's, artist, you know. Yeah, that's disappointing. Yeah, and, and and no offense to the youth pastor or whoever booked it. He's just trying to do something cool for his church, but his crowd that he had he didn't read that right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like that was yeah. that wasn't the band to bring in, if at if any band. But it was a memorable show and I loved it because Jason kept his composure and was is a cool dude and nice guy and he's just going through the songs. But I remember looking over at him and I think his like he had run out of clothes and like his shirt stretched out and I remember his collar is like I know this is so dumb but his collar is like stretched out like a shirt that you've been wearing and sleeping in yes and I just look over he just looked worn out in general yeah and he just looked point. tired and he's trying to be a nice good Christian dude and not just like lay in to anybody like you're you know what I'm saying like this is supposed mm-hmm. to be a rock show and I'm on the, literally the other side of the nation to play for you. <laughs> yeah. And, you're and tell- you've put me in front of these little yeah, children that listen to like... Right. Yep. 
And I just remember... Tales and... Literally, yeah. I think I think some of them had VeggieTale toys. But I remember just looking at him and being like, this is so funny and so awesome that I'm playing with Starfly 59, like one of my heroes, and we're in a church playing to what's pretty much a lock-in to Nobody Cares, and he's still a good <laughs> dude, and he's keeping it together, and he looks yep. hilarious because his shirt. <laughs> it was I don't know. It's just such a non-rock star story, but it's definitely... But know. it kind of is a rock star story because I feel like every rock star has that moment where they're playing to a crowd they don't want to play to. Oh, yeah. They're tired. They're exhausted. They want to go home. Yep. So, so I think it's more rock star than you think it is. <laughs> Definitely Christian rock star story. Cause yes, exactly. he held it together. He was humble and kind, and he's like, "All right." When it was over, he's like, "All right, let's go. Let's get out of here. I'm going home. <laughs> Goodbye. Let's go to the hotel, please." Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, I don't. I don't know if there's any more. I mean, I remember. I don't know about playing with other bands, but one or two of those Cornerstone shows for Dennis Mars was absolutely bonkers. It was so oh, fun. I'm sure. We played the Encore Tent. I mean, it's like it wasn't like overflowing like some bands, but it was a really good crowd, like way past half point, halfway point. Mm -hmm. And it just sounded good. It felt good. People were stoked. Do you feel like Cornerstone in general was just like the place to play? It was back then Um, because there wasn't like online. There wasn't YouTube and Instagram where, where bands could get in front of people so easily. Yeah. And especially Christian. So that was like, that was like it. Like if you, yeah. especially the Illinois one, but Florida, thank God, started and lasted a little bit. You know yes. what I'm saying? But even before Florida, if you could spend the money and the time and the effort to drive 24 hours or whatever it was to literally in the middle of nowhere, America, you were in the Mecca of yeah. like, they all came there. Like mm -hmm. every band came there. From like what you were saying, indie crazy stuff to huge mainstream main stage. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like you literally could go find your new favorite punk band playing on a generator stage in a tent, you know, by a tent to then literally 30 minutes later, you're watching one of the biggest bands of all time play on the main yeah. stage. You know what I mean? Like that is a crazy thing for your brain and your heart, you know? Yeah. It's so fun. And you would, in like the merch tent, that's just amazing. There was like, grew into like three or four merch tents and it wasn't just band stuff. It was like crazy yeah. stuff. I mean, there was stuff that shouldn't have been there, but they were giving the freedom to Christians to express themselves. So like yeah. some of it was gnarly and they mm -hmm. were doing what they felt like they were supposed to do. So good on them. But I mean, you could get like just Christian brand hoodies that were just yeah. a label just a clothing label that someone was trying to do but it might have had a cool logo or whatever and then the next table is literally like your favorite band or whatever and you mm -hmm. t-shirt and album and stickers and everyone's hanging out and food trucks before food trucks were cool you know what i mean like yes <laughs> yes absolutely um, that's how I felt with cornerstone florida it was like fair food all the yeah. time i always felt awful yeah. eating all that food because <laughs> it was like <laughs> funnel cakes or hot dogs yes. like there was no quality no uh like no. any sort of food truck you don't got time for that like, no you pretty much you're gonna grab a, a thing of french fries and you're gonna take off and yep. go to the next stage i can remember i mean cornerstone illinois like i've said in the past it uh it was like a love hate thing for me but cornerstone florida was like my family and I did that every single year that it was in existence. Like we so loved cool. it. And um, that to me is how you feel about Cornerstone, Illinois was how I felt about Florida because yeah. I got to see all these bands in one place in one weekend. And I nine times out of 10 got to meet them and spend time with them and actually have like, yeah, because at Cornerstone, I felt like, you know, you can go to a show and you can like meet the band after, but you kind of feel like, kind of rushed because you feel like you're taking yeah. up their time and they're tired or whatever. But at Cornerstone, it was like they wanted to be there. Mm -hmm. And that was like part of the gig was that they wanted to spend time yeah. with the fans and they yep. wanted to be in the middle of everything. So, you know, you would go into the merch area and you would just like hang out with these people. Yeah, because like 
a good reason for that is because it was in Florida and everyone was at hotels and they were clean. There wasn't, yeah. you know what I mean? Their lungs and noses weren't full of dirt yeah. and they yeah. weren't out in the sun. Cause Florida, yes. I remember it was pretty well, like it was always under. It was well covered. Yeah. yeah they had the indoor stage. Well, there was an indoor stage. Yeah. The hangar. Yep. And then they had like a little side stage that they did like more worshipy stuff in. Yep. And then in between the indoor stage and the two big outdoor stages that were covered, they yep. would do the tents with all the like new bands. Yeah, in between. And have like the food trucks and like all that stuff. And then you would get to the two indoor stage or the two big outdoor stages. And in between those two is where they had all the merchandise. Yep. So you would walk from one uh, stage to the other in you had to the walk middle. Through you the could, like. Yeah, you could, yeah. like, go buy a t-shirt on your way to see, like, you know. Which is a great like, setup for bands <laughs> to make yeah, actually make money. But it was cool because they were always hanging out. Like, you stayed yeah. at your table because you weren't uncomfortable and dirty and gross and tired. Yep. And so you did what you were saying. We had time to hang out and we wanted to talk to people because we weren't in a bad mood. You know, we weren't. Right, right. We hadn't driven. You weren't tired and feel like you just yep. sucked in 800 pounds of dust into your mouth while you were seeing your songs on your stage. Yeah, exactly. absolutely. Yep. For sure. And I remember seeing, like, um, one of the big bands. This is going probably a little past mm-hmm what the era of this music is, but I was major. When I say major, it's an understatement. It's an understatement. I'm ready. Majorly into Family Force 5. Oh, okay. Like, absolutely, they were my life for like a decade of my life. Like, seriously, I love them. And I remember (laughs) I remember playing with them in Texas when they were new and I didn't know what they were. I was like, I, I, that's I was like, the, what is that this was band? the beauty of them is that they didn't know what they were either. They just did their own thing. But I remember the last Cornerstone, Florida, I was in ninth grade and they played there. And my dad and I were walking into my parent, my mom and my brother weren't with us. I think they came later for some reason, but we were walking in, we had just gotten through the gate. We were heading towards, I think Showbread was going to play. And I love oh, Showbread. So yes. we were heading that way. Yes. And all of a sudden, literally all the dudes at Family Force 5 just walked by. Now, I'm 14 years Four- old. Yes. 14 years old. With their hair. And I'm just like. And their yeah, jeans. Yeah, and I'm just like. <laughs> Oh my god! And my dad's like, "Go talk to him. Go talk to him." I'm like, I can't talk to him. I can't talk to him. But that was like, the fact that they were so close and they were just hanging out. They were just walking around. Yep. They were going to see shows, like all this stuff, and it was just like ultimate starstruckness yeah. for me. Yeah. Um. But that, yeah, that I saw Showbread that year. That was actually the last, uh, one of the last shows that uh, Tay their screamer did with mm. them before he left. Um, <laughs> I love the show, but I saw chasing victory that year. Yeah. Amazing. Showbread was so cool. Oh my God. Showbread is so freaking. I still yeah. love showbread. Yeah. I listened. I literally just bought tooth and nail just reissued their first album. Oh, on wow. vinyl, And I bought that sucker so fast and I put it on. And I was like, Oh, this is like eighth grade Jesse time. Yeah. <laughs> <That's so laughs> I love good. it. I love it. Um, but yeah, I, I definitely, I feel like, and I hate that Cornerstone doesn't exist anymore, Yeah. but the industry is just not the same. You know, there's a new festival by some of those people. Oh, really? Yes. It's, what is in, it? and it's not in Bushnell anymore. It's in like Champaign. So it's like a city. Okay. It's, it's called, uh, audio, like audio feed or something like that. Um, but it's by some of the same people, um, and it's pretty much the same vibe as what I've seen. I've, yeah. I, I was planning on going this year to take my kids, because my daughter's 16, and my son's 12, and I've they've I've talked about Cornerstone and all this stuff mm-hmm. that we've talked about, and they're like, okay, Dad, well, we get it. Like, whatever. It's, I know, and so I'm like, this year, we're going to go check out this fest, yep. and then we'll go to Chicago and do cool city stuff, and then... Rona hit. COVID. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> and everybody's like, great, I'm at home for the year. Yep. Well, my brother and I were going to go to, um, I think it's called Fire Fest in Alabama. Is it Furnace Fire Fest. First, there you go. Yeah. Because they had, yep. their lineup this year was going to be in. Yep incredible. Yeah. And Showbread, one of them, yep. was getting back together to play their debut from start to finish. I got a secret so, for you. What? Did you, were you going to play? D-Mars almost was going to get together and do it. 
<laughs> oh my god! But the concert it was booked on the bass player's uh, 40th birthday. <laughs> Oh, no. So like, I'm not I had this. confirmed it. <laughs> I'm not doing it. Yeah, I confirmed it, and then literally the next day we figured it out, and I was I had to cancel. Oh. So for one like one day, D Mars were reunited. Were <laughs> yes, we were reunited, and we're about to discuss practices, yep. and then we're like, well, oh, pull it. Showbread was getting together to play. Um, my brother is a huge beloved fan. Yeah. And they were gonna get together and play, and he hadn't seen them since Cornerstone, Florida. Yeah. Um Stage so Acre was we gonna were, play. Yep. We were so excited to go. Yep. And then, like you just said, yep. Rona. Ruined everything. Good old Rona. Ruined the whole yep. year of everyone's plan. Yep, that's exactly right. But yeah, that t- I actually have a buddy that lives in Birmingham. I don't know if is that was that fest in Birmingham. Yep, yep, yep. Okay, because I messaged him and I was like, "Have you gone to this? Like, do you know anything about it?" And he's like, "I personally haven't gone, but a ton of my buds play, and they mm-hmm. say it's amazing." And I'm like, "Okay, this might be like our new cornerstone. Like, we might have to start going to it, this." Man, it was cool because it's called Furnace Fest because it's in like this um, industrial area of Birmingham. And it's these huge kind of abandoned, they're furnaces. So I don't, I don't know what the actual thing is, but there are gigantic furnace pipes and stuff. Mm. Um, but the, the main stage is all cement and it's like a huge loading dock. So it's just oh, like, wow. so the floor goes down and then levels out. And then there's a huge cement. It looks like a stage. Mm-hmm. And when we played, when Dean Mars played, was the first year Andrew W.K. played. And that, I don't know if you ever heard stories about his shows back in the day. Mm-mm. It went nuts. He had everyone on stage. There was just people everywhere. And he had people, he was, he was pe- taking people that were jumping on stage and lifting them up and putting them on his shoulders while he's singing. And oh his band is just going nuts. You can't even see the band because everyone's just going nuts and insane and the place is going crazy. Um, what year was that? I don't know. 2000 something something. That was probably 4, Excellent. 2004, 2003. Okay. I don't know. Something like that. I didn't realize that that festival was that old. Yeah. The um, Take Hold Records is what who originally started doing it. And that's Chad who eventually went sold take hold to tooth and nail and went and worked for tooth and nail okay so he had started doing furnace fest and um so it was like a mini cornerstone but then he also had non-christian some non-christian bands come in as long as they were not jerks or anything yeah sure um so it was kind of cool to mix it up and yeah people made friends like the bands would make friends and stuff and then people mixed it up and everybody was cool it wasn't like a corny thing because there was definitely some corny Christian fests out there too oh, that we played. Oh, <laughs> don't even get me started. <laughs> Thank God. Oh man. Listen, we went to so many of those. I, I remember one year we went to Kingdom Bound. Have you ever heard of Kingdom Bound? No, but I feel like I have. <laughs> <laughs> it was like um it was up in Live Oak, Florida. Oh wow. And it actually was at a really cool campground. It it, it really was cool, but I mean it was like I saw <laughs> You want to know how sad this is? Now, I was young. I was in, like, fourth grade. Do you remember the Donut Man? Yes. What? I saw him at Kingdom Bound. Oh, my God. I haven't even thought of that name know, or guy. Wow. Back. You just flash you just punched back. me in the face. Um, The Donut Man. Who else did I see? Newsboys, which I love Newsboys, so that was fine. Um, That was one of the first places that we ever saw Skillet. Mm. Um. Man, there was so uh, Buck Enterprises. Uh, was it an outdoor stage? Yeah. Oh, that's mm-hmm. weird. I, we might have played that because I remember playing <laughs> Live Oak or something. Uh, it's all such a blur. I know, but I, know. I do remember playing some outdoor stage out of a church in like Live Oak or something up there. One of well, those... this wasn't a church. This was a campground. Oh, okay. Because the cool. whole concept, the whole concept was, is you camp there all weekend. Oh, okay. Then that wasn't. Yeah, so I was gonna we, say this was small. There was like yeah, this was like a pretty there. The stages they were pretty pretty large. Okay, cool. Um, no, this was like truck bed stage. <laughs> oh no 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 no! I think we're there was there. I think there was Christian 
motorcycle gang involved, if I remember right. <laughs> Weird. Um, uh, I've, I've done it all. I've played it. Hilarious story from Kingdom Bound, and then we'll move on from there because, you know. Oh. Um, I was super into the Newsboys. Nice. And so... That's like, the first concert I ever worked as a teenager. Was Newsboys. At Carpenter's yeah. Home. Mm-hmm. And that Which was... Which one was it? Take, was it... Um, Take me two liters of the microphone. I have no you don't idea. know. You don't care. <laughs> I did not care about them at all. I thought I did not like them. I loved them. But I, I still really do love them. I but, loved um, working the show because yeah. all that meant was me and my crew of buddies got to run around backstage and go get water. Oh, cool. yeah, we'll go get water. And we just kept running around. Yep. Um, my cousin nothing. Ashley did that a lot, actually. You you probably have met my cousin at some point, but that's a story for non-podcast. Okay. Um, <laughs> so anyway... I loved Newsboys. And the thing that Kingdom Bound was doing is like in between. So a lot of the shows were at night. Mm -hmm. And so during the day, they would do like Q&As with like pastors. Oh, yeah. Volunteers and like people that were in the ministry and like all the stuff. Yep. So Lord forgive her. um, My mom lied (gasps) and said that she worked in the ministry so that she could get in the Newsboys Q&A. Awesome. So she could try to get pictures for me and stuff like that, because that's how into them I was. And that almost makes up for the Joy Electric rave, right? You, you gotta does. admit, it kind of does. It kind of does. Um, Good job, mom. So I was pl- there was like a in the little like uh, what do you even call those things like picnic awning areas mm-hmm. where they're having it. Like I was like waiting for them to come out because my dad was like, if you just stand here, they're going to leave. And then you can say hi to them. Yeah. So you actually get to like interact. And so I did. And <laughs> I love they, the opened the, they opened the door and Peter Furler walks out first and he like looks, he turns and looks like he's like, hi, how are you? And I just like looked at him. And just screamed at the top of my lungs and just <laughs> ran across. No way. <laughs> I totally did. Total Beatles. I totally did. And I just you like. Beatles went. out. Meanwhile, my dad is still standing there. And mm. he said that Peter just looked at him and is like, did I do something wrong? And my dad's like, no, you, it's just her. Just, it's fine. Thank you. <laughs> Goodbye. But it was like oh. that whole thing. Like my mom had like set it up and like got a part of it so that we could be right by the door and like all this stuff. And then the, my moment of truth came, and I just like turned and ran for my life. Like he was like holding your a mom gun to my send. head. Your mom send. Your mom send for you. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I know. And I totally you blew ruined it. it. I did. I did. You know. But you know what? I met Peter Furler. I ended up meeting Peter Furler two years ago um, when they did the Newsboys United tour. Nice. Um, and I felt like I, uh, I should have asked him, like, do you remember that one time? <laughs> but, um. You I terrified like I, a little girl. <laughs> he pro- I guarantee you he probably He probably does. That. You, you um, remember stuff like that. Uh, but funny. anyway, I, I, I redeemed myself because I actually shook his hand and was like, thank you for making such great music. You're so great. And he's like, thanks. So, so sweet. That's like, awesome. Right. Fourth, That's awesome. Fourth grade year old me. <laughs> she got her redemption. I love your yeah. I love your music history because you literally did like you were raised in all of this. But I oh, love yeah. I love you're a huge Newsboys fan I, and then I was. grumpy at Cornerstone. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. That's so good. What, but I was in middle. Listen, I know. I know. I totally needs get to be it. Preface by the fact that I was in middle school yes. when I went to Illinois. Yes. Middle schoolers are the worst. Yeah. No. Because in, in Florida, you had a ball. It was awesome. Yeah, of course. Florida, Florida was great. I loved it. I, I absolutely. Because you loved came it. into that age of like your eyes are open. You're like, yeah, exactly. Oh I yeah. was able to like run around more. Yep. And do my own thing. Yep. And like, I didn't have. See, my brother had friends that would come with him to all of this stuff. Like we yeah. always took. Yeah. We always took a van load of like him and all his buds. I was a, the loner. I didn't oh, have friends that came. Yeah. So I would... was going and doing all this stuff by myself. Yeah, you needed a squad. So, um. Oh, no, I was fine the way it was. But, like, I remember Obviously. at Cornerstone, Florida, like, this one lady, she made these, like, uh, little buttons that you could buy with all mm-hmm. the band logos for, like, a dollar. And mm-hmm. I literally, every year, I would buy, like, I would spend, like, $20 on buttons. So good. And I would put them on this backpack, and then I would bring it every year. I was one of those kids. I loved I it. I probably could have created a squad there but yeah because i was carrying that backpack nobody wanted to be my friend anymore. no that's not true 
That's not true. I loved kids like you. I'm, that's why we made buttons. I made patches. Yeah. Um, I wanted to be on your backpack. So you probably were, don't, to be totally honest. Don't bad you mouth yourself. Were. <laughs> that's awesome. Well, Eric, thank you so much for coming on to the oh, podcast. Man. I really can't express how much it means to me. You're my first guest. Uh, that's my so cool. Thank you guest. for that honor. Thank you. Thank for that you. Honor. It means so much. Um, and uh, for those of you that haven't listened to any of Eric's uh, newer projects, uh, when tell me when uh, are you going to put the new Mr. ENC? Is it going to stream or is it just going to be the seven inch? Oh, it'll stream. It'll be out on everything, okay. Spotify and everything. Um, cool. But the seven inch will be probably mostly sold online, but I will get some copies. So I'm going to bring some into the shop. Yes. Um, and then if we ever have shows. Um, we will we'll we sell, will have shows we'll sell them there we but yeah shows. you'll be able to get them online cool yes. um and then if you uh want to go check out um his on and on, on ep it's amazing thank you amazing thank you, incredible you, go listen to it um eric thanks again uh thank you. we loved having you on and hopefully we can have you on again sometime i would love it and i'm gonna try to really talk some buddies into getting on this yes Yes, we're I will crooked. try my hardest. No promises, but I promise I will try so hard. I know. I believe you. I believe All right. you. I have faith. Thanks, man. Thank you. Bye.